we've been in the midst of a series called Relationship Reformation. Our entire goal has been to help you max out your relationships. Our goal has been to help you to have a relationship that represents God's well and glorifies God. Amen? Somebody had said during this overall series in our relationship conference, someone once said, it's not how long you've been married, it's how well you've been married. And so many people have been married for a long time but have not been married very well. It's not how long you've been married, it's how strong you've been married. So I want to add another feature, another dynamic to that on today. In our first sermon, we talked to singles and we talked about finding love in the right places. And so very often we go fishing in bad ponds and wonder why we come up with catfish revving in in white bass, right? It's where you're fishing at, right? Where you're fishing. All right, now second sermon, we had a message by Dr. Booker. He talked about the purpose and the meaning of marriage. In our third sermon, I talked about being all in. We have people who are in relationships but are not all in to the relationship. We have people who are in the relationship but are not willing to do everything necessary to make the relationship effective, make the relationship um, joyful, make the relationship significant. Amen? Today I want to talk to you guys from 1 Peter chapter 3 because my goal has been in these messages not just to, to give you messages but to help transform your relationship. The reality is if you've been married for any length of time, you know that trouble often finds you. You don't have to go find trouble. Trouble will come find you. But you can say amen or just say ouch. Either one is good, okay? And so when you've been married for a length of time, you know that that sometimes trouble becomes your lot. And very often in a marriage relationship, we think that if we are believers, then we shouldn't have to face the challenges that marriages face. The reality is is that the, the same challenges those who are believers face in their marriages are the same challenges non-believers face in their marriages. But the question becomes, how do we manage those challenges? The divorce rate is about the same among those who are married, and I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah, but the, it's, it's always the same among those who are married. But, uh, the divorce rate is the same um, among those who are Christian as it is among those who are non-Christian. And so it should make a difference if we are people of faith We ought to be able to manage difficulty in our marriages differently from those who don't have the Word of God, the people of God, and the Spirit of God. Amen? So here's the question. The question becomes, are you battle ready? The reality is everyone will face battles in their relationship, but the question becomes, are you prepared for the battles in your relationship? Ephesians chapter 6 says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Very often we confuse our mates as the enemy when the devil is the enemy. But the question becomes, how do you protect your marriage? How do you protect your relationship? Um, um, how do you battle well when, you're, when, you're, when your marriage is embattled? Amen? So what happens is very often we feel ill-equipped when we face challenges, when we face dissension, when we face warfare in our relationships, because we're not battle ready. We have been battle tested, but we failed. I want to help us be battle ready and pass the next test that comes our way. Amen? The reality is we talk about marriage. We really don't talk about conflict. We don't talk about dissension. We don't talk about how do you manage life when you're sleeping with the enemy? Smile at me. (laughs) How do you manage life when you don't like the one you walk around the house with? How do you manage life when, 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 boy, you can't stand the person you share the bank account with? And so we don't talk about those things. Boy, how do you manage that? So I prepare my message today. My my last few messages have been around 55 minutes. Praise the Lord. Amen. And boy, I want to thank you guys for enduring and standing and listening. Amen. I was doing this message today, and I was going to talk about the um, how should men respond, how should women respond, and was you know what I I, I kind of need to break this up. This is just too much for one message. It's really two messages. So, but where in the Bible does the Bible talk about making sure your relationship is battle ready? See, boy, we have battle behavior, but the question becomes, do we have battle bad behavior when the relationship is bad? In the book of First Peter, the first um, the book of First Peter is designed to talk about our salvation, but it also talks about our salvation in the context of our suffering situations. 
Are we tracking? I'm, not, I'm just going to go with the outline of the book of Peter. First Peter talks, number one, it talks about your salvation as a believer. Chapter 1, chapter 2, verse 12, my, your salvation as a believer. In chapter 2, verse 13, chapter 3, verse 14, it talks about your submission as a believer. And then from chapter 3, verse 14 to the end of chapter 5, it talks about your suffering as a believer. And so what he talks to us about is how do you manage suffering? In chapter 3, verse 1, he picks up and he speaks to a wife who has a, who has a husband who is not submissive to the Lord. When I'm getting to the heaven, I'm going to ask why did you start with the guy? All uh, right? Because <laughs> the guy's the one that's always messing up, right? So watch this now. Smile at me, all right? So he comes here, and, and in verses 1 through 6, the brothers didn't say a word. Women said, all right? In verses 1 through 6, he says, here is how a wife ought to respond where she has a husband who is disobedient to the Lord. Then he comes in verse 7 and says, You know what, husband? Here is what you ought to do when there's tension and when there's suffering in the marriage relationship. I want to start with the men rather than starting with the women. Is that all right? And I want to start with the men because God has challenged men to lead their households. He didn't come and say, Eve, where are you? He came and said, Adam, where are you? And so when things went bad in the garden, God came to look for his representative who he had put in charge. Not because man was better, but because God had ordained the man to be the one who suffers, the one who takes initiative, the one who sacrifices for his family. Amen? And so men need to stop being passive and look into women to solve all the problems and step up and step in and do what God has called us to do. Amen? So he comes here in chapter um, 3, verse 7, and says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Don't get nervous. We'll explain that. Since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. So he comes here, and boy, he says a, a, a number of things, but the, but the issue he's really trying to address is how do you respond biblically when you and your maid are suffering in your relationship. And so and so before I talk about what a typical man does, I want to talk about what a godly man, what a spirit-filled man, what an obedient man does for his family when he's in the midst of a suffering relationship. Amen? Because there are some men out there who are godly, who are obedient, who are the point men for their family. There's some men doing that. Amen, sisters? And so number one, watch this now, a man who, 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 who helps transform dissension to light his household, he cares for his wife's whole person. In other words, watch this now, when it comes to many men, so they say, well, 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 you know, I, 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 I got a job, I brought my check home, I take care of the household, but you know what, when it comes to caring for a wife, it's not just your check, you've got to care for her whole person. Care for her emotionally, care for her spiritually, care for her medically, care for her financially, help care for her professionally, and then help take care of her financially. Amen? It's the whole person. Number two, he considers what's in her best interest and not only his best interest. And so what happens is very often you have men who look out for their own interest, but not for the interest of their mate and for the interest of their entire family. Number three... It's, boy, he, he's constructive and not destructive. So what happens is when, 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 boy, life begins to tighten up and things get tight and men get frustrated and his wife is not talking to him very often, that man, if he's not spirit-filled, that man can become destructive rather than being constructive. Number four, he's consecrated to the Lord. I know that's an old, that's a, that's a old word right there, the word consecrated, right? It's the whole idea of being set apart for God's purposes. It's the idea of being fully committed to God. It's the idea of walking with the Lord. It's the idea of being submissive to Christ. It's the idea of being sold out to the Lord. In other words, guys, when things get tough in your relationship, you can't abandon your faith. You still got to be committed and sold out to God. Amen? We got to be confident. Number five, he connects with her emotionally, not just physically. Can, can, can I get a witness, sisters? <laughs> and so it's important when things get tight that, that boy, he doesn't just try to touch her on the outside, boy, but, but he tries to touch her on the inside. Number six is that he conscientiously listens to his wife. 
Now, see, boy, most of the time guys listen like this, don't they? they listen, yeah, huh? I'm listening. What you say? Yeah, yeah, boy, I got it. What you say? Yeah, huh? Yeah, yeah. I'm listening. Yeah, uh-huh. Oh, boy, they turn the television channel. Yeah, I'm listening to everything you say, and boy. And so typically men listen while they're distracted. And, boy, when things get tough, a man needs to listen conscientiously. He needs to put his phone down, put the remote down, put his computer down, put his iPad down, and look at his woman in the face and say, you've got my full attention. Amen? Amen. And so but this is what an obedient man, and this is what a spirit man, this is what a godly man does. But the reality is this is not what most men do. <laughs> I identified the typical response to dissension and suffering in marriage by men. I stopped at 10. Number one, what does a man typically do? A man typically, when, when there's dissension, when there's suffering, when the marriage is not going well, a man typically denies personal responsibility. It ain't my fault. You just spoiled. It ain't my fault. The woman you gave me, God, is the cause for this, all right? <laughs> Number two, a man typically, when he's, in a, when he's in a dissatisfying relationship and he's suffering, they typically deviate from God's will because men don't do well with pain. I don't care what they say. Men typically don't do well with pain, amen? And so typically, a man goes to look for relief rather than belief. She doesn't remember, okay, okay, Lord, I don't care what it takes. If it's, a, if it's a bottle, if it's a person, if it's a job, if it's a pill, just give me something to alleviate the pain, even if it's outside of your will. Number three, men typically, what happens when they're suffering, they destroy the relationship further. In other words, watch this now. They begin to practice activities that make things worse rather than make things better. Number four is they begin to defend their position and activity. You ever have a defensive man in your wake? You got, you got it on video. He's like, no, that ain't me. Uh, 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 I can't believe you said that guy right there. That ain't me. I mean, boy, where'd you get that picture from? That's not me. And they be, I mean, boy, they dig in and they stand their ground. They become defensive even when it's clear they're wrong. You ain't got to say amen. I know I'm right. I know I'm right. Watch it now. Number five, well, well a, a typical man denigrates their mate when, when the relation, like, you, know, you know what, it's just your fault. If you would have cooked, we wouldn't be here. If you had more sex, we wouldn't be having this problem. If you cleaned the house, we wouldn't be going through this stuff. You say, well, well what does cleaning the house have to, have to do with you being a decent man? What does cooking dinner have to do with you cultivating your voice? What does taking care of the kids have to do with you coming home on time? Those things aren't related. And so watch now, a man begins to denigrate his mate. He begins to blame the woman for what's wrong in the relationship. Number six, a man often becomes depressed. Watch this now. I know he's defensive. I know he's deviating. I know he's talking bad. I know he's abusing you verbally, but that's just a reflection time um, sometimes of a man who is depressed. Because, see, men don't like to fail. Any man worth his salt doesn't like to fail. And when a man is failing in his relationship, and boy, he can't get a grasp on it, then boy, it bothers him on the inside. He may have a great job and may make a lot of money. You know what? It's even worse when a guy can run a company, but boy, but boy can't produce a healthy family. He can manage millions of dollars, but can't manage four people in the house. He's gone to school, and boy, he's accomplished. They call him mister. They applaud him when he comes. But when he comes home, he's a failure. And men get depressed, and men get discouraged, and men don't know how to function. That's the typical response when a man's got a bad marriage and can't solve it. Next, he becomes disinterested. He goes to find something that, 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 that boy can be more satisfying, more, more engaging, more fun, all right? Who wants to go where it's not happy? Who wants to go, boy, you're reminded you haven't done well. So, boy, he finds other interests. N number eight, he be well, watch this now. He becomes distracted by work or worthless people and or pursuits. Am I talking to somebody this morning? Watch now. What happens is if a man's not doing relationship, then, boy, he tries to pour himself into his work or he pours himself into something that makes him feel more worthy. Whether or not it's of God, I want to be worthy, I want to be celebrated, I want to be applauded. And so very often it's not a matter of the work, it's that he's not happy at home. 
A man's gonna go where he gets where 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 boy he gets satisfied, he gets applauded, he gets encouraged. If that's work, he'll spend more time at work. If that's the club, he'll spend more time at the club. If that's a bar, he'll go to the bar where everybody knows his name and they're always glad he came. <laughs> Number nine, he will detour the real problem. In other words, watch this now. He begins to focus, watch this now, on the residual issues rather than the core issue. Talks about everything else than what the real issues. Um, 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 number 10, sometimes men just disappear. You know what? I'm getting tired of dealing with this. I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting tired of the abuse. I'm getting tired of the problem. I'm getting tired of the frustration. I'm getting tired of the heat. I'm getting tired of the backlash. And so men just have a way of disappearing physically, spiritually, and financially. They just fade black. Anybody say, I ain't seen him. Y'all say, no, I ain't seen him either, all right? The turkey's scared to come home, all right? Why? Because things are so tough at the house, I just rather not go there. Now, so but we look at at the at the obedient man, how a spirit man, um, how, how a spirit man responds. Let me look at a typical man. And boy, I'm not bashing brothers. I'm trying to equip the brother. I'm just trying to show us brothers how these responses are deficient. They're ungodly, and they don't resolve the problem. Are we tracking together? So, brother, as you are, I'm not trying to beat you down. I'm your friend. I want you to max out your marriage. I want to see you max out your manhood. I want to see you be all you can be. And the reality is God has placed you in that household, and God has you there because God wants to use you. Don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. I know you've taken the typical response, but the good news is there's a non-typical response as well. And as long as God is alive, things can turn around. As long as the Spirit of God is active, God can transform a household. As long as God is real and you're listening and you're responding, God can make you into the man he's designed you to be. Amen? If God can create something out of nothing, he can, he can, he can definitely create something out of your bad relationship. So in 1 Peter 3, chapter 7, he talks to us. He gives us four things that we can do as men to help transform dissension into delight. Number one, he wants you to maintain your composure by not doing what's typical. So boy, here's part of the challenge. You know, um, you can be you can be a PhD. I'm a, I'm working on my PhD right now, and boy, by the grace of God, I get there, right? Smile at me. I get there, right? All right. Now watch this now. Watch this now. I've never had a class on how to balance my checkbook. But I'm about to get, I got two master's degrees, about to get a Ph.D. degree, and I've never had a class that taught me how to manage my personal checkbook. Now watch this now. When it comes to marriage, most times none of us have training or adequate training on how to be married. When it comes to being a man, seven out of ten men, African-American men, are born into a single-parent family household. There is no model in place to show them how to be a man, how to be a father, how to be a husband, how to be a provider. And now you are married and things have gone bad in a relationship. You know how to be married when things were good, let alone how to be married when things are bad. Are we tracking together? And so what I'm trying to show you, watch this, guys. These typical responses are the natural responses that you enact when you don't know what to do. But today, the good news is God's going to show you from his word what to do when you face dissension and suffering in your relationship. Number one, you've got to maintain your composure. You can't lose your wits. You can't lose your mind. You can't know what? Enough is enough. I'm just out of here. I can't handle the pressure anymore. I don't want to face the facts of what I've done. I'm done. No, 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 no. Maintain your composure. We had a lady who was here a couple of weeks ago. Um, her her daughter-in-law actually goes to our church. And so I was talking to people in between service. I was greeting them, giving them high fives. And so I saw Mrs. George. She's an elderly woman. And she, and boy, I've seen her come to church here several times over the years. And she said, Pastor, I'll be having an open heart surgery this week. I said, Really? I mean, you, 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 you look totally healthy and, and fine. She said, Yes, Pastor, I'm having open heart surgery this week. Pray for me. I was blown away at how well composed she was several days before open heart surgery. Guys, watch this now. Some of you all are not having a literal open heart surgery. You're having a figurative open heart surgery, and you're about to lose your mind. 
She was having a literal open heart surgery and maintained her composure, maintained her confidence in God, maintained her thinking. She wasn't trying to exit the situation. I'm going to face this by faith and do exactly what God is calling me to do. So, man, where are you at right now? Are you reaching for a bottle? Are you reaching for a person? Are you reaching for another job? Are you reaching for a substitute rather than maintaining your composure? Look at verse 7, please. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. He just said a lot right there. This word live right here, um, 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 zoe means life in the Greek, but that's not the word that's used here. It's a, it's a compound word that's used here, and boy, it's got S-U-N, soon on the front of it. It means together. He says, together with your wife in an understanding way. He says, he says number one, he says, I'm sorry, number two, he says, maximize your comprehension of your mate and her needs and your responsibility. Watch this, man. When there's suffering, when there's dissension in your relationship, God wants to make sure you maximize your comprehension of the woman you're with. Let me translate. In other words, God says, stay with her in the midst of uncertainty and gain greater understanding. He says, live with her. Don't, don't try distancing yourself. Don't, stop, um, 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 uh, don't try fighting her. Don't try making her change. He says, men, try to make sure you understand the woman that God has called you to be with. Here's the challenge with men. Men typically have had girlfriends and but emphasis on girls, not a woman, a girl. They've had girlfriends, not womanhood, girlfriends, not women friends, girlfriends. And so boy, they know how to deal with girlfriends, but don't know how to deal with this one woman. And men often assume because they've had experience with other women, they know how to manage this woman. And your wife has told you a million times, I'm not other women. You gotta learn me. Uh, amen? I don't know what's wrong with y'all, but I'm about, I'm preaching up me today, but y'all sitting there tripping on me, all right? Watch this now. I'm saying the same thing y'all been saying for years, right? All right. Watch this now. So watch this now. What happens is a man does not take time to study his woman. Now watch this now. Awareness is different from understanding. So boy, I got a million books to read right now for my PhD comps, right? Um, comps and exams. And so boy, one of the things I do is I'll go get the book and boy, I'll get it in Kindle. And then, boy, I will, I will, I will, I hit play. And then, boy, I follow along as they're reading. I'm following along, and I'm probably, boy, I'm taking notes. I found myself um, on Friday and said I was tired. I was, I was physically tired on Saturday. So, boy, I got my audio plan, and boy, it's going through it. And so far, I just close. That's why I just listen to it. And so I close my eyes, and boy, it's going through. I'm not taking any notes. I'm not highlighting anything. And boy, I get to the end of the section. So, you know what? I've got no idea what that last section says. I heard the information. I closed my eyes to meditate upon the information. <laughs> All righty. I didn't take any notes. I've got no clue. What, what, watch now. I had awareness. I had it read to me. I went through it. But when it's time to take my comprehensive exams, I did not engage the material in such a way I can reproduce what I've been exposed to. In other words, guys, I didn't study it. And many men confuse listening to closing their eyes, meditating upon, not taking no notes. They assume that studying their mate. Guys, when you study your mate, you put your devices down. When you study your mate, you stop comparing her to somebody else. When you study your mate, you learn her movements. You learn her proclivities. You learn her love language. You learn how she talks. You learn what upsets her. You learn when to step in, and you learn when to step out. You learn when to move ahead, and boy, you learn when to stay back some. You learn her emotional language. Men, are you studying your woman? And very often when we have arguments, but we have disagreements, it's because we don't understand. We don't understand what the other person needs. See, guys, anger and dissension are often a result of an unmet need. And men, you got to be able to determine what is the need I need to be trying to meet. You can't do that when you're in a rush. You can't do that on the go. You can't do that if you're disinterested. You can't do that if you want to be on automatic pilot. And so what he says here, he says, guys, you got to maximize your comprehension of your mate. He says in verse 7, he says, live with your wives in an understanding way. He didn't just say live there. He says, understand her. 
he says, he says, he says, he says, number three, he says, make sure you consider her significance in God's eyes. Make sure you consider her significance in God's eyes. Yeah, you guys still with me? Y'all getting bored, aren't y'all? Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. And boy, this 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 word live in the Greek, it's it's a compound word. It, it has soon on the front of it. It, it means being together with her. He, he, it's it's um it's um kata gnosis. Kata means according to. Live with her according to knowledge. We tracking together? He goes on and says this. He says, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Now watch this now. There's this, there's this myth that the church is anti-women. There's this myth that, that orthodox biblical Christianity supports the oppression of women. There's this myth that, 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 that boy, your value is tied to gender. That couldn't be anything further from the truth if you really understand this Bible. Are we tracking together? So watch this now. He says to the men, when you all are facing dissension and suffering in your marriage relationship, I need you to understand the value of the woman that you've married. Are y'all still tracking with me? Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 12 through 15, actually it's verses 11 through 15, Paul says, I suffer not a woman to teach, but, 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 but to learn from her husband. Da, 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 da. In the ancient Near East culture, they didn't value a woman enough even to teach her. So what Paul says in the book of 1 Timothy was revolutionary because Paul was opening the door for a woman being made in the image of God and boy, having enough value to teach her to understand theology and understand God when the rest of the culture didn't even want her to learn. Are we tracking together? So watch this now. When you really understand what the Bible is saying, you see, Paul was a liberator, and Paul was pushing for, for the value of men. Watch this now. In the book of Malachi, Old Testament, Malachi. Oh, the book of Malachi, um, some call it Malachi. All righty? All righty. It's, it's called Malachi, not Malachi. All righty? You know I mean, boy, it, it ain't no, it ain't no, it ain't, it ain't no um, man burger. All righty? Um, Malachi. All right? Anybody just, so watch this now. Over in the book of Malachi, um, he says, he says, I have a problem with you. He said, well, well, Lord, what's the problem you have with me? He said, I've got a problem with you because how you have treated the bride of your youth. You know what I mean? I can't treat you well because you didn't treat her well. Is that a God of chauvinism? Is that a God who does not value women? Is that a God, you know what, women are secondary? No, 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 no. When you read this Bible, it says, men, when you're in the midst of duress, you're in the midst of a suffering relationship, don't denigrate her, don't blame her, don't distance yourself from her, don't disappear. Why? Because she's my girl, she's valuable, and you ought to treat her as such. So when he comes here and he says, he says here in verse 7, he says, he says, showing honor to the woman. In other words, boy, elevating her, nourishing her, cherishing her, lifting her up, elevating her. You know, the problem is today, men want to put their wife on the same level as other women. I made this statement a couple weeks ago. When you treat your wife the same way you treat your mama, you just mistreated your wife. Amen, 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 all right? That one got me too, shoot. I mean, <laughs> when you treat your wife the same way you treat other women, you have just mistreated your wife. When you treat your wife the same way you treat your darling daughter, you have just mistreated and underrepresented your wife. He says, show her honor. Are you honoring your wife? Are you, I mean, it's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, your wife. Are we tracking together? Don't hesitate. God the Father, God the Son, Holy Spirit, your wife. <laughs> he says, show her honor to one. Watch this now. As the weaker vessel. Now, now watch that, boy. This weaker vessel does not mean inferior. We all are made in the same, same thing, but we're made in the image of God. Psalm 8 says we're made a little bit lower than the angels. 
And so, boy, God sees value in all of us as his image bearers. And so, and so boy, there's not a difference in value, even though there's a difference in function. And so our society and our culture, we put more value in function than we put in ontology, um, 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 ontology the um, ontological value of somebody. Oh, watch this now. He says, here, he, boy, she's the weaker. He, he says she's physically weaker, but she's not emotionally and mentally inferior. When you read weaker vessel, don't read inferior. Okay, let me catch you. I can explain this. How many remember, remember back in the old days that, boy, you had more than one set of um, china? You know, boy, you had your everyday plates that you, boy, you, you ate all that junk on. But then when special occasions come, you had the curio cabinet, and, boy, that was the real stuff right there, right? And so, boy, when, when boy, Aunt Betsy came by, and everybody was coming by for Christmas, you would go, boy, you put all that old stuff, all that chip stuff up, right? And, boy, and, and boy, and boy, you went and got your fine china, and, boy, you opened up the curio cab, and you began bringing that stuff out, and you began getting the serving platters out, and, and getting the night, boy, those heavy forks, you know them heavy forks, boy, boy they're just real, real thick, not that little thin, cheap stuff, right? And, boy, boy you get the real, 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 real nice, thick stuff, and, boy, you bring that stuff out, and, boy, you begin serving that stuff, and watch now, boy, what God is saying, but when it comes to a woman, you can't view her as cheap, everyday dishes. You got to view her as fine china that's in the curio cabinet. Are we checking together? All righty. Now watch this now. From, from, from the naked eye, glass and crystal look alike. But when you go and start handling crystal, Crystal has a clarity glass doesn't have. When you go and grab crystal, crystal, crystal has more weight than what glass has, all righty? Watch this now. Crystal costs more than what glass cost. God is saying, men, do you understand the value of what God has brought into your life? You're treating her like a piece of glass rather than fine china. And see, well, well, what, 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 the population be way down, all right? Wait, wait. It's like, well, well, we didn't even got an average of one child per man, all right? Man? It could come up like, after one time, they're like, no, I'm done with that. But that's just way too painful right there. We ain't doing that again, all right? All right. Man, we ain't, ain't nowhere. Well, we stub our toe, hit our little pinky. We done for the day, right? Well, we be at the house all laid out like that. All right. Oh, Lord. Oh, man. Oh, man. What happened? I had a hangnail, all right? Um, so, um. Boy, you don't get up out there. Watch this now. It's not inferior. It's not emotionally weak. She's fine china. Watch this now. He says, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. Watch now. So, boy, what is the grace of life? Boy, it, boy, boy it's, not, it's not generic. It's, um, it's um, definitive. He's got a definite article here. The grace of life. And watch now. Boy, it's the unmerited favor of God. Men, don't think that you are better because you're a man. Man doesn't have an inside track to God. Are we tracking together? He says, man, you've got to understand, watch this now, that when you're dealing with this woman, this fine china, she is equally an heir of the grace of life just like you. You're not better. You're not superior. Your thoughts are not better. Your ideas are not better. you got to value her. Are we tracking together? She, she, she's going to receive the same thing you receive in eternity from God. Number one, you got to maintain your composure. Number two, you got to maximize your comprehension of your mate. Number three, you got to make sure you consider her significant. Number four, you got to make sure you're conscious that how you treat her impacts how God hears you. Make sure that you're conscious that how you treat her impacts how God hears. Is that a God who oppresses women? 
Is that a God who doesn't understand the value of a woman? Is that a God who gives a man a leg up no matter how he treats a woman? It's not at all. He says here in verse 7, it's, it's a bunch of verse 7, isn't it? He says here in verse 7, so that your prayers may not be hindered. He says, man, you got to understand that when you mistreat that fine china, I've allowed to bear your last name. When you mistreat the woman I've allowed to come into your life, then, man, don't even come talk to me how you want a better job, you want a better income, you want a nicer house, you want a nicer car, you want your business. Guys, you know what? Until you treat her better, don't say a word to me. Women, you are so valuable that God says he will shut down heaven if a man mistreats you. That's not a chauvinistic God. You're so valuable that God says that when a man mistreats his wife, not mistreats the finances, not mistreats education, not mistreats his employees, when a man mistreats his wife, God didn't even want to hear his prayers. Brother, let me ask you a question. How many of y'all are praying for a larger income, better health, bigger business, more contacts? God says, first place I want you to look is how you're treating the woman in the curio cabinet called your home. So, man, when things get tight, when things get rough, don't turn to the typical. Make sure that, boy, you're conscious that, boy, based upon how you treat that woman, it's going to impact how God hears your prayer life. I ain't trying to dog you, brother. I'm trying to help us. I wish somebody would have taught me this before I got married. I didn't have to learn the hard way. My job is to help you maximize your manhood, maximize your marriage, maximize you in your role. I want to help you navigate out of the out of the challenges and the dangers of this thing called marriage. Amen? When we know better, we can do better. Now you know better. Will you do better? We didn't come to beat you down. We came to build you up. We didn't come to emasculate you. We came to equip you to be the man that God has called you to be. Here's guys, this is the first time many of you men have ever heard something like this. And it's cool. We all, we all learn something every day. Amen? And so I want to encourage you, man, Humble yourself, change your patterns. Change. Here's the challenge. Many men have not led in their households for so long that your wife don't trust you to lead the household no more. So, man, it's not going to be easy trying to get the reins back because she don't trust you. So you got to regain trust. How do you regain trust? You consistently do the right thing over and over and over and over again. And at some point in time, it's not your job, it's God's job to change her heart and to cause her to relinquish the reins. Now, ladies, I'm going to tell you all something. Now, I still need y'all to, okay, how many ladies come to church? Okay, raise your hand if you come to church. I had to get your buy-in first, all right? Okay. Be, 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 before I change, okay? Okay, so, okay, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I ain't got no paper, but I got a camera. I want to get a picture of this. How many of y'all coming <laughs> next week? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. All right, okay, I, I got it. Panoramic view, I got it. Okay, I got it. I got it. All right. Ladies, next week, your week. Next week, your week. Next week. Ladies, next week is your week. Smile. See, but y'all got quiet. Okay. Y'all was smiling and, and clapping and happy. Next week, your week. We got it on record. You already said you're coming, so we'll see you here at 9 11. But seriously, that's what I want to share with you all because I think that sometimes what happens is even with women, you all respond unbiblically when your man's not obedient. Amen? So I want to share a harmless biblical way to talk to you.